Hello, and welcome to Office Hours with EAB. My name is Erin Preston, and I'm a managing director at EAB, responsible for helping our partner institutions meet and exceed their enrollment goals, which, as many of you listening likely know, is not the simplest task today with the changing demographics and market forces that colleges are navigating. This afternoon, we're going to talk about the options available to schools that, despite their best intentions, haven't hit their enrollment targets for a while and aren't likely to reverse their fortunes in the foreseeable future. This is a problem that's facing a growing number of colleges and universities in the United States, where, as of this year, an average of one school per week is either closing its doors permanently or merging with another institution out of necessity. We're going to talk about why that's happening with increasing frequency, how to avoid that fate if possible, and how to recognize before it's too late that your options are narrowing and may warrant steering a course that minimizes the casualties. One of the great things about my role is that I get to work with a lot of really smart people. And with me today to talk about this uh, rather gloomy subject is a longtime friend and colleague of mine who I've gotten to know really well over the years, John Wexler from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thanks, Aaron. Great to be here. Well, we're thrilled thrilled to have you. Um, and, and John, I know we've spent time talking about, about this subject in particular, um, certainly over the years. Would you mind telling our listeners briefly about your role at RPI and about how you developed a professional interest in the subject of university mergers. Sure thing. Um, in my day job, I'm the vice president for enrollment management at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, commonly referred to as RPI, where I oversee admissions and financial aid in our what we call our summer pipeline programs, where I've been for just over nine years. What got me interested in the topic matter we're going to be discussing today is when I was doing my um, doctoral degree at the University of Pennsylvania and deciding what to do for a dissertation, um, I got curious and looking at the landscape in particular for small private colleges. I graduated from one. I went to Goucher College in Towson, Maryland, and I'm also on their board. And so I just got curious. And what I was finding, there wasn't a lot of research. Most of the research had been more Europe and other international countries, but not a lot of research had been done on mergers, particularly of smaller colleges. Um, and so that got my curiosity going. And that was my subject matter where for my dissertation, I looked at a successful merger between two small colleges in New England and an unsuccessful merger attempt between two small colleges in New England that took place around the same time. Great. That's great, John. Um, and can you, could you take us through some of the macro factors that are challenging the survival of so many colleges and, and universities? And, and to what extent are institutions simply staring at the low ebb of cyclical trends that we expect will reverse themselves over the next few years? Sure. I mean, the first thing you look at is the population decline of students graduating from high school. This will be the first, probably from now to 2031, will be the first time since World War II, so 75 plus years, that there has been a decline in the number of available students that are graduating high school and, and thus have the ability to go to college. And so the industry of higher ed has never experienced this. Um, as it's been built up over, since the, you know, since the 40s, higher ed has been built up. So you have a first time a decline in population. You overlap that with in the last five years of pandemic and then the FAFSA debacle. And so both of those have dried up the pipeline for potential students coming in. They've altered how students have to, you know, if you look at COVID, it obviously all schools suffered from that, but I don't think any school suffered more than small privates. They lost their student body, and a lot of times they have not seen it fully recover. And if they have seen it fully recover, they've had to increase the amount of financial aid to get to the same headcount to fill the resident halls. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges. The other challenge is we're in an era where uh, big flagship state universities, i.e. football schools, are really dominating the headlines you see them every Saturday. They have become not just institutions where students go in the state, but they become more destination institutions. If you look at the University of Alabama as an example, now 60% of their students come from out of state. That number was 35% just 15 years ago. Right. So within one high school grad generation, you've seen a whole different mindset of students and where they're willing and where they're looking to go. 
John, you um you kind of you you just segued nicely into where where I was hoping to take the the conversation a little bit, which is you know which types of institutions would you say are, are most at risk versus types of schools that seem to be in a stronger position? And certainly you've outlined what we've seen in terms of trends in the marketplace and demand really growing exponentially over recent years toward kind of larger public flagship type uh, institutions. So let's um let's drill down to a scenario where a college or university realizes it's in trouble. So uh, um, you're kind of research up to this point and expertise and through various conversations would suggest um, more so falling within kind of smaller private type institutions. Let's let's drill down a college. Let's let's say they're in trouble. How often do boards or senior leaders through through the research you've done take bold steps and act while there's still a chance to reverse outcomes or their fortunes? And how many would you say realize it's too late? They're kind of slipping under the waves, and then they just simply allow things to decline. I, I guess I want to hear a little bit of your perspective on um, a result of inaction or ineffective action, and how you how you think about that. Sure, I think how I looked at it was, you know, smaller would be a thousand or less students, a thousand or fewer students, and probably a fifty million dollar or less endowment. So not a bit large endowment. The bigger thing would be, are you an institution that used to be at 1,700 and you're now at 1,000 in less than a decade? Because how are you budgeting accordingly? Are you still operating like you're 1,700 students when you're really 1,000 students and that's the new, and you haven't become, you haven't set your budgets to the new normal? I think for boards, you got to remember they meet four times a year at best. This isn't usually what their bailiwick is um, and expertise. Many of them have been on it a while, and they remember the days where they had trouble 10, 20 years ago, and they got out of it. But the population's different. The situations are different. Um, and I think many times they think hope is a strategy, and hope is not a strategy. And so I think at many, they don't like to think about the downside. Um, I think they are now, now that they're seeing, to your point, which you brought up earlier about a, a school's closing per week since the beginning of 2024, it'll probably accelerate. If you're reading some of the literature that's out there based on when headcounts come in in the fall. Um, so from that standpoint, I think they're not preparing and many times they're reacting instead of acting. And that's a problem with small college boards. It could be a problem with any board, but really, you know, we're not talking the IVs or, you know, big time, you know, there are about 120 schools or more with over a billion dollar endowment, but that's out of over 3,000. Right. So there's a very small population that's in a very good position and everybody else is armed on combat, um, hand-to-hand combat. So um, I think you got that schools need to sit back and see where they are and what indications are that things are gonna get better. Do you have new donors coming in? Is there new majors being created that, tie in to marketplace, um, you know, from that standpoint, where would there, where, where, where would the potential be? And the potential is not there. What's plan B and what's plan C? Yeah. And are you ready to act on those? Um, well, well, maybe that's, maybe that's why we get along and why we've worked together for so long, because I would also agree hope is, is not a strategy um, uh, as well. John, you, um, you have mentioned to me before uh, throughout your putting together your dissertation that you've spoken directly with um, college presidents and had kind of various interviews. Any um, like insights there kind of along the, the same thread of uh, inaction or yeah. kind of that decision point as a a president, um, how 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 and when they would be willing to pull the trigger on making certain decisions? Any insights from those direct conversations? Yeah, I think so. I spoke to the presidents at all four schools, but I also spoke to numerous board members at each of the schools involved. And one of the things, especially for the merger that was not successful, is they waited too long. Um, they waited too long. They were, you know, when they got into discussions, the school that needed to be acquired. Um, the key to them is that they come in with the best balance sheet they possibly can have. And balance sheet means enrollment, but it also means debt level and, you know, how much was there. Um, and in some cases, what's the mistake schools can make 
that are struggling is they decide to build because they think, um, you know, the old uh, you know, saying that you build it and they will come, they redo it, they build a new dorm, they build a new building, academic building. And the reality is the enrollment doesn't come quick enough or doesn't come at all. Right. Now you've compounded your problem because <laughs> now you put more debt on your books and you're now more in that you, now you've created a scenario where you're you're less attractive than you actually were prior to that um, because schools don't want to take on more debt. It's a killer. Um, and the types of schools you're looking to merge with, while they're doing well, they may not have unlimited resources to take on a merger and they can handle a lot of things, but nobody wants to take on debt. Um, and so what I've looked at is, you know, the more debt you take on, the less attractive you are to your counterparts. So if you're in a position where your institution and you're at your leading institution, you're at an institution, they may not be doing very well before you do anything else that would add more debt to your books, really think about what is the long-term play. And if there's any thought that you need, might need or be, want a merger partner, would this really be an attractive, not only the facility, which may not be needed with the partner you're merging with, but the level of uh, financial obligation you're taking on in doing so. What, um, John, you mentioned a couple couple statistics, uh, data points that are, are likely highly important throughout this type of uh, exploratory process or kind of considering current positioning versus what, what types of options exist depending on the, the financial status. You mentioned you know, enrollment, of course, level mm -hmm. of debt. Uh, what other, um, through your, your work, um, what other data should college presidents be really honing in on early to get a good sense of, of their overall position? So in my data and doing my, in doing my research, I created what was, what's called, what I have called the merger runway index and MRI in which, um, schools, particularly the ones we've been talking about need to take a look at their total assets minus the total liabilities over a 12 month period and see if that's changing greatly. Then when doing that, and this is all public information, so you can also look at your counterparts, your peers, your aspirants, best of breeds in the, in the industry and see where they sit. And I think if you see any movement there on a downward trajectory, you need to worry. Um, you need to take a step back. Now, maybe one quarter or one year, but if you see a two or three year pattern, that's not a pattern, that's a trend, and that's the new normal. Um, and are you recalibrating, and can you? Can you become smaller? You know, Is it doable um, with the contracts and obligations you've taken on? If you've just built a, re resident, a new residence hall and you've taken on a lot of debt, there's not a lot of flexibility you, you have um, without the growth of enrollment to fill the rooms to pay off the justification of the resident hall. So I think what schools need to look at is not only where they sit, but using information data that's out there, iPads and others. And iPads can be a little late in the data, but much of it is, is you can gain earlier. Um, and take a look, well, I'm gonna take a step back there. So in the data from iPads, it takes about a year, but if the patterns are there mm -hmm. to see where schools in the direction, especially coming out of COVID, it's really important not to look at the years of COVID because the two things people have to realize is, yeah, they were down, but they were also getting a tremendous infusion of cash from the federal government. Right, right. So that, that those aren't really true numbers. You really have to look at basically FY 23, 24 and beyond to see where you are sitting from that standpoint. And then begin having the hard conversations with your board. Um, obviously you don't want these things to get out in the public because it can impact fundraising, enrollment, and there's the overall morale on campus. Um, Aaron, I was curious, you know, you've talked about, um, we've talked about the balance sheets and the conversations that people are having with their CFOs and others. Um, what areas are you seeing um, in, the, in your data, your team is seeing that it could advise schools on how to handle these situations? Yeah, well, you know, I'd, I'd say one of the, the both fun and uh, and challenging aspects of my job uh, is helping colleges and universities understand their potential to change market share or drive um, drive growth in market share. And and one of the most uh, fascinating things for me is if on the on the surface you look at demographics, 
you very plainly can just see mathematically where across the country, certain markets are more challenged than others, which types of institutions may be more naturally positioned to see uh, decreases uh, in potential enrollment activity, um, just, just sheerly based on the numbers. But it's, it's always so interesting. You can take a school that resides in an area where popul population's growing, let's just say Florida, for instance, who is seeing um, a, a deficit in their, their enrollment outcomes. And so uh, you look at that and say, well, that doesn't align necessarily with demographics. Whereas on the flip side, you can take a, a college that resides in Iowa in the, in the Midwest in a more challenged market and they have enrollment growing. And so in those instances, it, it, in my experience um, and expertise, and I've, I've been with EAB and doing this in some this type of capacity for the last 15 years, it has so much more to do with market share. And so, you know, a lot of the, the data and things that I'm looking at have to do what type of recruiting strategies are in place. Um, are there kind of smart, efficient recruiting strategies? How early are you getting to students? How, how often are you in front of parents? Are you in the right markets? And so a lot of the work, work I do um, is, is helping institutions devise strategies to do that efficiently and effectively and really ensure that the application demand exists to support, to support their goals. Now, Certainly market share and the market forces at large obviously play a role in terms of institutions if they were to run, you know, John, your your MRI, your merger runway index, the understanding of potential to drive a different type of market share obviously plays a role in that. I would I would say there are likely, and, and I imagine you would know, some institutions who are better positioned, even if their outcomes aren't strong at present to, to change that outcome versus others who are not. So I'd say that's that's um, where I'm spending a lot of my time and how it intersects with with some of the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, John, so, OK, you did you you ran your your MRI, your merger I runway did. index. You did that for four different scenarios. Is that right? I did. I did. Okay. The main one I focused on was the merger that wasn't successful. And, the, and then looked at best of breed in the industry. And you could see the, the reason I published it is that there was a, you could tell that at certain times by taking on more debt, they then shrunk their runway. They had less runway to navigate through. Um, and, you know, case in, or they decided, oh, we've got, we're gonna fill the resident hall. So we're gonna give away more financial aid. And interestingly, when one institution did that, while they brought in more enrollment, they were in the same, they, the overall net tuition revenue was exactly the same within a few thousand of what it was prior to that because they'd given away too much institutional aid. And the theory was, we'll bring the aid in for a few classes, then we'll pull back. That is very hard to do, yeah. especially when yeah. you don't have a big brand mm -hmm. uh, because you, you, know, you see a lot of these institutions are highly leveraged with Pell students, which have limited incomes. And so they're really not able to pay, to, to, they'll, they'll go to the publics before they will pay a little bit more in tuition to go to the, the, the private institutions. So, so walk me through then an ideal merger scenario. What I, what I just heard a, a big kind of theme or takeaway from your research is around the timeline and offering enough of a runway to, to right. uh, inflect or create a more positive type of outcome. So in thinking about what an ideal merger scenario, if there even is such a thing versus an outright college closure, does it really just sure. have everything to do with timeline? Like what other steps can, can university? So I, think take? That I think the first thing you can take a look at, and it can vary, you know, different schools take different approaches. Um, but the one is obviously proximity, meaning how close are you to another institution that can play a role. Um, and the other is what majors do, we, do the two institutions have? So if the bigger institution is able to acquire a smaller institution or do a merger, as they say, and they're gaining new academic majors, that's a plus. Um, if they're just caught, if they basically have the same curriculum, that can make it hard to justify the merger because you necessarily won't grow enrollment and you won't grow diversification in your um in your, in your academic curriculum. But if you can acquire a university or a college, if a university or college acquires a place that they are able to expand their portfolio, that's a positive. Also, mm -hmm. if one of the institutions that's being acquired has online capabilities that the other one may not, platforms, that is a very highly valuable commodity. 
Yes. Because if they if the other if the larger institution has curriculum and content that's ready to put on these platforms, then they can utilize what they're acquiring to have an immediate impact on enrollment. The other is if you're acquiring an institution and the proximity is not too far away where students would go can go easily, maybe with, via a shuttle or even walking between the campuses, then you know you're acquiring new resident halls and new athletic facilities and new recreational facilities and new classrooms. That if the the institution that's in the, that's the in the catbird seat is looking to expand, but they may be landlocked right. from where they are, it allows them to grow without necessarily having to purchase or build and take on more. You know, what we talked earlier, more debt uh, from that standpoint. Uh, and the final thing is, you know, what is the value of what they're taking on? You know, someone could be taking on an institution where the land is very valuable. You're seeing this right now with um, uh, the Art Institute of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Many people are looking at that because, the you know, they have now announced they're closing, but their land is valued at over $200 million in downtown Philadelphia. That is a valuable commodity. You know, one can make the argument if a little better planning had been in place, they would have, there was no reason they should have closed that somebody in a large market like Philadelphia should have been an acquirer of that institute because the value in the land itself would have justified any takeover. Yeah, yeah, great point. John, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on a, a spot here as we get close to wrapping. What what do you, what would you say is the was the most surprising thing that you learned through your conversations or research about all of this? You've obviously outlined it. Yeah, I, I think there were a number of things. One, and all I interviewed 25 people and a number of them, the the um none of them brought up unless it could be used for growth, the academic programs. Meaning, you know, the, people want to think, oh, you know, the academics, what's going to happen? You know, then this is a, you know, when you're getting down to the basics of this, it the acquisition is about um, what can, it, the immediate impact to the bottom line. The other thing is, you know, all these institutions, the understanding from board members concept of the academic calendar, you know, we start in September, not much takes place in the summer, faculty around nine months. So putting these type of things together is not easy. And it's much shorter and much harder than, than they all envisioned doing. And it's one reason um, failed. An example being that, you know, if you're in an institution that is considering and are in a, in a merger, you have to think about when you're gonna execute that merger. Mm -hmm. Case in point, you don't wanna go much be, beyond December if you can, because you have to issue acceptance letters. And if you have acceptance letters out and students think they're enrolling and then you announce a merger in the late spring, early summer, that may not be the institution the students thought they were going to. And in particular, if you're thinking you're gonna need to close, it's even a bigger disaster. Um, so from that standpoint, because the other thing that people don't talk about is the expense in doing a merger. It's tremendously expensive. Um, between outside counsel, PR firms, and then once you take on the merger, you have to decide how you're going to brand the new institution. And, you know, the reason I try, you know, the, the, we use the word mergers, but someone's always got to be the big dog and someone's always larger than the other and someone's going to be in charge. And so it's not a true merger. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and, and, in and, and you'd say that's a, that's a, that's, um, that was the case for all of the various. No, that was the case for the ones that failed. The one, the merger right. that failed, is the comp, the school that was definitely in the stronger position said they regretted not laying on the table from day one. This isn't a merger. This is an acquisition. We're going to be running things. Interesting. They, tried, they said we tried to be nice because we wanted everybody to feel good and didn't want to get morale too down. But it goes. But midway through, we realized that he's this one guy said these guys really thought we were equal. And there was no way in heaven. And then it resulted in in ideal, not an ideal outcome. Right. right. It, it, it resulted in unable to get the deal done because the positionality that they all were in was not, everybody around that table from the two institutions had a different understanding of the position they were sitting in uh, midway through. And it was a surprise. Well, I, you know, clearly a, a tremendous amount of, of factors and considerations. Um, John, you've been extremely generous with your time today. And so my my final question here before I let you go, would you mind you know, sharing your top pieces of advice for university leaders or others who uh, may be listening to our podcast um, 
about how to get their financial house in order, how to plan for what comes next when the very foundation of that house starts to crumble? What would be your your top advice as we close out here? I would say in the land in the landscape we're sitting in right now, be very conservative with your expectations on all fronts. And if you exceed them, great. Um, but don't overpromise and underperform. And in that, you know, take into account all the factors. You can have a headcount, but what is the discount rate? How much financial aid are you giving away? And start budgeting for smaller incoming classes and start budgeting for the, the new norm. Um, you know you're gonna have a smaller population. The student is in the driver's seat when selecting the schools. We, we know the discount rates continue to go up. So there's no point in setting up expectations that you're gonna grow tremendously and there's gonna be more revenue and then we can do these things. Why not on the other side say, you know, especially if you're a small private institution, you have to look at what is your advantage. And we talked earlier about the advantages you know, of a big, big public university, football and all that, but there's also a lot of downside. The personalization, the unique experience of the student, you know, many students like, the, you know, being in um, a setting where they know their professors and they know their fellow classmates. So maximize that, take into account how that can be a benefit, not a, you know, a unique, um, how it can be a benefit against the competition yeah. and position it that way. But I, I do also think that has to lead to outcomes, that this environment produces better outcomes for students they're able to get more interaction with the career service office. They're able to talk with their faculty about what would be a good internship or maybe a good place to go to graduate school. You know, those type of things that lead for better outcomes. And you can't run from outcomes because they're transparent. They're, you're going to see them. So you have to embrace them. And But I think within that, you know, don't understand that the, over the next few years, you know, the, nobody's going to be flush with cash. You know, um, the federal government's not coming with another uh, payment program for institutions. So, um, and there's never that big donor that everybody thinks they're going to get. So from that standpoint, make your expectations realistic and explain that to the community and be upfront and embrace it and embrace what the challenges are and be determined that with the environment that you're producing, Students want to come there and we'll have out positive outcomes both while they're there and when they graduate. Fantastic. Well, I, I appreciate those uh those words of of wisdom and facts to wrap wrap us up there, John. Uh thank you again so much for your time. Uh really, really appreciated it, John. I hope we'll we'll get some listeners here. Uh but I thank you. Too. Again. Thanks again. Thank you.